Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I have got a glass of wine here because I'm going to continue my look at Bill C-21 with a look at the municipal handgun ban provisions. And you're going to want a drink for this because it's really bad. Um, it's bad because it's a bad idea, but it's also bad legally speaking, in my opinion. So let's uh, dive in and I'll talk, tell you what I'm talking about here. So the key bit here is this uh, sort of section or this bit here. So conditions by law. Subject to subsection 2, the following conditions are attached to a license authorizing an individual to possess a handgun. So A, the individual must not, within the boundaries of a municipality, store a handgun at a place other than a business that is the holder of a license that authorizes it to store prohibited firearms or restricted firearms. So this is a provision contemplating essentially central storage bylaws. And so they note uh, that this is in the case where A, there's a bylaw to that effect in uh, force in the municipality. B, they've notified the federal minister in the prescribed manner of the passing of the bylaw. And uh, three, they have provided the prescribed information to the federal minister or a person designated by that minister in the prescribed manner. So this provision basically says uh, the criminal power will apply uh, to these sorts of storage bylaws. Uh, the other kinds that they contemplate under B is simply a blanket ban, which says you must not store a handgun within the boundaries of the municipality at all, and must not transport it to or from a place within those boundaries, other than to or from a place a peace officer, firearms officer, or chief firearms officer is located to a port of exit in order to take it outside Canada, or from a port of entry in order to bring it inside Canada. It's really kind of strange that they've said that you can't transport it from those places. Like, wouldn't you want to get the handguns out in that case? You can't store them. You can't take them out. Are, you know, what happens in this circumstance? That seems to me to be a, a very unusual provision and one that is potentially very problematic. So, um... It seems to me the guns should at least have some sort of escape clause for these cities. How do they escape the city? Uh, C, so the third type that they're providing is the individual must comply with any prescribed requirements relating to the storage within the boundaries of the municipality of a handgun in the case where... So this is something where they can say, oh, you need, you know, this kind of safe or that kind of safe um, or, you know, some kind of container. Uh, it would be really interesting, in fact, if they specified that you had to store it outside of a container, like it cannot be stored inside of a securely locked container, because now they've created a problem of contradictory law. But that's only part of the problems that we're dealing with here. One of the first things, and I'm going to take a sip here. So one of the first problems is this bit. Following conditions are attached to a license authorizing an individual to possess a handgun. What this is intended to do is it's intended to get around the problem of the division of powers. And I'm going to get to the division of powers problem. But first, I just wanted to talk about this aspect. So there, rather than this being a blanket law that it's an offense to violate a bylaw in a municipality, they're adding it as a condition to a firearms license which means that the only way that you can break this law is if you are a licensed gun owner. If you are a criminal who doesn't have a license and you are dealing drugs and whatever else, these provisions literally don't apply to you. They cannot, you can't be charged under them. You can't be convicted under them. You have a, a, a get out of jail free card. So it's very strange you know, often as gun owners, we say, you know, oh, this is a law aimed at law-abiding gun owners. And usually what we mean by that is that this is a law that only law-abiding gun owners are going to care about. You know, if they ban handguns, then people who want to follow the law are still are going to say, well, I guess I, you know, I got to give those up or, you know, but... Uh, whereas the drug dealers, of course, they're not going to care. You know, they never... They never cared about that one way or another. You know, an authorization to transport requirement. Um, I apply for authorizations to transport my guns, 
but drug dealers on the street are not doing this. So we say, you know, this only affects law-abiding gun owners, but really, I mean, you can be punished for breaking it if you are not a licensed gun owner. The This municipal handgun ban section, on the other hand, only allows for punishment if you are without a license. So the drug dealer cannot be punished. This is purely 100% aimed at licensed gun owners and no one else. Literally not at all. So when they try to say, you know, we're aiming at criminals here, they're really not. This is aiming at people who have never committed a criminal offense, people who have passed a background check, uh, people who have owned firearms and used them safely and lawfully for years. Um, those are the only people who can be punished by this. Yeah, I'm going to take another sip. Because, oh man. Now the next problem we run into here is uh, one of the Constitution. Now, when I say the Constitution, most people, when they think of the Constitution, immediately leap to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is a constitutional document in Canada. But it is not the only constitutional document, because Canada's got a constitution from 1867. And one of the key provisions in that, and, you know, a really important set of provisions, is sections 91 and 92. What those do is they basically slice up the pie of theoretical powers of government and they give some of those pieces of pie to the federal government and some of those pieces of pie to the provincial government. So some things are federal government powers, some things are provincial government powers. Uh, let's have a look at this. Now, importantly, these provisions are not subject to Section 1 of the Charter. Section one, you know, people say, oh, it's a get out of jail free card, you know, for the government. They can just justify anything under section one. Well, that's not quite true, but also doesn't apply here at all. People say, oh, well, they'll just use the notwithstanding clause. Well, you can't notwithstanding this stuff. This is fundamental constitutional law. There is no escape clause for the government for this stuff. So we see here section 91 is powers of the parliament, which is exclusively to the federal government. And that includes all sorts of things, you know, navigation and shipping, currency and coinage, banking and the issue of paper money. This is all stuff that goes to the federal government because you want, you know, a, a unified system. It makes much more sense if we have the Canadian dollar rather than if we have Alberta bucks and British Columbia dinars and you know, so forth. So we we want to have one constant currency. That's, you know, the postal service, uh, military and naval service and defense. You know, you definitely want Canadian military as opposed to the New Brunswick military. Again, that makes sense to me. Uh, so one of the important provisions here, I don't mean, I'm not trying to dunk on New Brunswick, but a small, you know, a small sort of province running its own military would just not work that well. Uh, criminal law is a federal head of power. And the reason why this matters is that there's actually provisions, sort of practice that says that they can't give that power away. The federal government has the power of the criminal law and they can't give that to the, uh, the provinces and they can't give that to the municipalities. Now, when we talk about municipalities, municipalities are actually under the power of the provincial legislature. The Constitution doesn't speak to municipalities. It doesn't actually contemplate um, them as having any sort of constitutional role. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't contemplate their existence. We see, you know, municipal institutions in the province. So municipalities can exist under the Constitution, but they exist because the province's give the municipalities power because the provinces, you know, bring these municipalities into existence. So they can decide, for instance, that the city of Vancouver, you know, can't, has the following powers and maybe not some other powers. So that is a really important distinction is that municipalities are a, a creature of provincial power. They're an extension of provincial power 
They're not a thing unto themselves until and unless they're made to be such a thing. And, you know, the provinces can decide not to. They can take powers away from municipalities. So what we see here is a real effort to take the criminal law, which is a federal power, and give it to the municipalities. And they're trying to bypass the provinces as well. Now, I don't know that this is going to work because the provinces can, of course, say municipalities do not have the authority to, uh, you know, to create a bylaw that bans, you know, firearms or a ban law, bylaw that restricts firearms. That's something that the provinces could do and that would defeat this. But the other thing is just the notion that the, you know, federal government can give away that criminal power to municipalities is one that I think is going to be extremely constitutionally suspect and especially is going to be challenged. We've already heard that Quebec is not happy with this provision of Bill C-21, which I predicted in a past video. So I said Quebec is not going to like this idea and Quebec does not like this idea because Quebec likes the power to be with the province. They don't want it going from the federal government directly to the municipalities. They do not want that at all because that essentially takes their, you know, it cuts them out of the deal. So there's going to be fights over this. And I'm sure they're going to say, oh, well, no, this is just, you know, us regulating ourselves. Except the problem is, is that they've made so many public statements about how they are specifically trying to give this power to the municipalities. Um, I am not a constitutional law scholar. I, and to be frank, a lot of the constitutional, I reached out to some constitutional law scholars. They all sort of said, we're not really familiar with this one, but frankly, I think that if this, if Bill C-21 passes, um, the fight over this one is not only going to go to the Supreme Court, it's going to end up in every constitutional law textbook uh, going forward. You know, in terms of this is a major division of powers case. So this is, this is a big deal. This is not, you know, I'm not just saying, hey, this is a minor problem. This is a big deal. This is a big fight coming if they pass this. And I can't, I just kind of wonder why they're, why they're picking that fight and trying to pull apart the bonds of confederation for this. Uh, Anyway, um, continuing on. Application of conditions. So the conditions referred to in those paragraphs apply only if a period of 180 days has elapsed since the day on which a notice is sent. So there's a 180-day essential grace or charging up period. Uh, the federal minister must notify the municipality once the federal minister is satisfied that the criteria have been met. And they have to send a notice. So the registrar must give notice in the prescribed manner to the holders of a registration certificate uh, who store a handgun in the municipality in question of the date on which the condition applies and the obligations with which the holders must comply. So you might get a notice saying, hey, um, you've been living in this town your entire life. Move. Yeah. Um, I, I think that this is bizarre and this is going to end up having all sorts of effects. Uh, notice to federal minister, municipality must notify the federal minister once a bylaw is no longer in force. After notice referred to in subsection 5, is that's the not in force, received by the federal minister, or if the registrar otherwise becomes aware that a bylaw is, has ceased to be in force, the registrar must give notice in the prescribed manner to the holders of a license authorizing the holder to possess prohibited firearms or restricted firearms who reside in the municipality in question of the date on which a condition ceases to apply. Now, I'm kind of a shit disturber sometimes. So I'm just thinking like, let's say I am, you know, the town of, you know, Blackacre, and I really want to mess with the government. And there are a hundred thousand handgun owners in the town of Blackacre. Man, could you rack up their bills in a hurry? Because what you do is you pass a bylaw that says we are banning handguns in Blackacre. And now the federal minister has to fire up the presses and start sending out letters to every handgun owner in Blackacre, which is actually 
surprisingly expensive. And then two weeks after that, you, you wait for all these letters to go out. And then you say, we are repealing the bylaw. And now the federal government has to go, oh, bugger, we got to fire up all the presses again and send out the letters saying that it's ceasing to be in force. And so you wait for those letters to go out and you say, we are banning handguns within the town of Blackacre again. And you just lather, rinse, repeat until the registrar runs out of money. Again, this is one of those things where they seem to have created a bill that really is pointing a gun at their own head. And I always kind of wonder whenever I see governments that sort of create this possibility that sort of a renegade town could start trolling them like this. Because, I mean, if I was the mayor of Blackacre, I might be that much of a, you know, that much of a troublemaker. Hey, registrar, how's those printers going? Send out another one. Yeah, I, I really don't see why they did that. Oh, well. Uh, the conditions uh, referred to in paragraphs 1A to 1C do not apply to a handgun, A, that has been declared in the prescribed manner by an individual who holds a license authorizing the individual to possess the handgun to be necessary for their training or for a prescribed sporting competition. Note that prescribed means that it's, you know, in the list. So uh, training for a prescribed sporting competition, when you're wondering what they're going to prescribe, if you're thinking... You know, my favorite, uh, you know, if you're thinking of your favorite sporting competitions, the answer is probably no. Um, they're probably not going to include those. Uh, B, for which an individual holds an authorization to carry. So this will not include, uh, for instance, armored car drivers. Or C, in the prescribed circumstances or for a prescribed purpose. So they can, by regulation, create all sorts of exceptions here, which they have not detailed at this stage. So there's also a provision for publication by the commissioner. Uh, they must maintain a publicly available list of the municipalities where a condition referred to in subsection one applies. Um, naming tip, I suggest maybe calling it the Karen list. Just, you know, if you're just spitballing, throwing out ideas here, if you're wondering, because this is really a set of provisions effectively encouraging uh, Canadians to make bylaws to go after other law-abiding Canadians and force them out of their town. So, Karen List seems like a good one to me. Uh, if you have a different thought, let me know in the comments below, but I think I may have taken the, the winner on this one. Anyway, um, I can sort of anticipate a question I'm going to be getting in the comments, which is going to be what happens with respect to antique firearms, because, you know, people might be saying, I have an antique handgun. Well, first of all, if you only had an antique handgun, well, then you wouldn't have a firearms license necessarily. You might not have one, in which case this couldn't apply to you at all. But uh, the other thing is that antique firearms are considered to uh, not be handguns or not be firearms at all for the provisions of the Firearms Act. And so that wouldn't apply. Now, the antique handguns do count for... Uh, purposes of regulations for storage as well as for the storage laws so they are somewhat affected but they wouldn't be covered by this section so it looks like antiques would be accepted this is really uh, one of the big advantages to criminal law in canada is that criminal law is monolithic that criminal law is consistent so you know, it's illegal to stab somebody in Vancouver and Quebec, you know, and, you know, Quebec City and Edmonton and Toronto and wherever you are, it's illegal to stab somebody. And it's equally illegal to possess meth. There's no town where meth is, you know, legal. Uh, we have this consistent pattern, you know, you, the self-defense rules are the same everywhere you go. And this provides for great consistency. It also provides um, for great, you know, it makes it possible to, for instance, explain the law to you guys. I find it way easier to talk about, you know, when somebody says, hey, what's the law with respect to firearm storage? I can say, great, that's easy. But, uh, you know, if somebody says, hey, what's the law with respect to 
when at night do I have to stop hunting? I say, that's a tough one because we've got many provinces and they each set their hunting rules. Now, when somebody asks me, what's the law with respect to firearm storage? I'm going to have to say, well, how many towns do we have in Canada? Because every town might have a different set of criminal laws. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just weird. It's bizarre, to be honest. Um, why would you want to fragment the criminal law when having a unified criminal law has been such an advantage for Canadian, you know, jurisprudence? Um, as a lawyer, I can look up case law that might have happened in, you know, Toronto or Ottawa or wherever. And I know it's got some applicability because we're talking about the same criminal law. You know, is something a flick knife? Well, I know that because the same definition for flick knife applies everywhere across Canada. You know, whether you're in the, you know, furthest north part of the Northwest Territories or right down south, right, you know, next to the border. In fact, you know, 20 meters over the border crossing. So... That, to my mind, is a fantastic and beautiful thing about Canadian law. I compare this to the, the states, where you can sometimes have very different rules uh, from crossing from one state to another. And I think that that's not so great. Uh, I think that that, you know, creates a problem. You sometimes hear of people who get charged for something because they accidentally crossed the state boundary. And they didn't realize that the law was different or they even got lost. You know. Google Maps goes crazy or, you know, Apple Maps, uh, probably Apple Maps more than Google Maps from my limited experience, but, uh, you know, whatever mapping software you're using and it takes you across the state boundary and now you are a, you know, committing a felony. Canada hasn't had that and I don't think we should have that. I think that this is sort of stepping a toe into a really bad idea. So... Even if you don't like guns, even if you think guns are terrible, this idea of breaking up the criminal law and of starting to have the federal government give the criminal law away uh, to towns and municipalities is really ugly. Um, it's got all sorts of bad potential consequences. Uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of my thoughts on this one. It's... I think that this is quite possibly the worst provision of this one. I know that uh, I know that the airsoft stuff is going to get more attention, and you know, fair enough. But I think that this is so bad, um, and not just on the gun owning aspect. I mean, my local mayor has said that they're not looking to ban handguns here, so maybe I'm safe for now. But, you know, who knows what things will bring, you know. But uh, the just the whole idea of this, in my view, is a really... Uh, I don't see why they'd be doing this. I just... Anyway, that I'll leave it there. Um, I think my frustration with this is somewhat evident, so... Thank you for watching. I know this video is kind of depressing, but it's on a really important topic. So please hit the like button. Please share it with your friends. Please share it with anybody who might have an interest because this is a huge issue. And I think it's a huge issue in terms of not just, you know, the gun issue, but the fabric of Canadian society in terms of the division of powers. So uh, share this one as far as you can. Uh, subscribe if you want to see more content. You know, I talk mostly about firearm law, but I venture into other areas of law as well. Criminal law is my thing, but so subscribe if you want to see more content. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters. Uh, there's a link to Patreon or my Patreon page below if you want to support me. Uh, at the $50 level, D. Mo, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Firearms Association, North Central Process Service, and Kyle Martin. At the $20 level, Cameron Johnson, Dale Nesbitt, Andrew Elsich, and Sites and Arms Limited, as well as a whole lot of you at the $10 level uh, who will be in the crawl immediately following. 
Thank you once again for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge and uh, I don't know what else to say here. I think this is a a fundamentally bad idea, not just because it's sort of an area that affects me, but because this is an area of essentially trying to undermine uh, the constitutional division of powers. And that, I don't think that's a good idea here. Uh, quite frankly, I think that if they want to strike at that division of powers, the way to do it would be properly not to sort of try to engage in this end run that they're doing, but instead to just go ahead and try to amend the Constitution Act. But uh, they obviously don't want to do that because that's a very difficult process. Um, maybe I'll do a video if there's some interest later down the road on what it takes to amend the Canadian Constitution because it's not an easy formula, I'll tell you that. Anyway, thank you once again for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge and see you next time.